Welcome to Cafe Rollist. After a little interruption for me to center again, I guess, on myself, uh, because I was getting a bit tired. I'm coming back on uh, the easy way with uh, uh, a friend. I mean, everybody's friendly on Cafe Rollist, but uh, someone I know better and I'm chill to ch to discuss with. Hello, Mira. Could you introduce yourself for people who don't know you yet? Yeah. Hi, I'm Mira. Um First and foremost, what else? Do, what else do I do? I do podcasty things. I work with the, with the podcast zone with Dragon Me, and I am a really keen RPGer. I'm also a member of the No More Damsels community and the Hate uh, Games Club down in Hackney, Hackney area tabletop enthusiasts. I'm learning to play Frostgrave right now, and I yeah. That's me. Hi. You you work with the podcast zone. You mean you work with all the other people involved in the podcast zone. You are the podcast zone. Well, I mean, I think I look after the email and the Twitter. And if there are any opportunities for UK gaming podcasts or kind of fantasy podcasts where we can go and like be part of an event, then... Yeah, that's kind of what I do. I try and coordinate that, or just if I know something's happening, I can point all those people in the direction of an event. Hey, little one. Your little one is behind you. So cute. Hello. <laughs> so, yeah, um, the podcast zone, we do collaborate with Dragon Meat annually, and um, we were actually uh, hoping to have some podcasts at UKGE this year, which I think we still have a, a little bit of a showing online. Um, but, yeah. Podcast Zone is, it's cool because there are a lot of podcasters who are already doing incredible things and it's just, it quite, it's quite, it feels like a good gang to be part of on Twitter. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of podcasters, but we don't, we don't really form a community outside of Podcast Zone. The, we don't have that many interactions. I mean, you, you got pairs or maybe trios of podcasts who do things together, but most of the time we... We exist in parallel, we know of each other's, but we, we don't engage that much with each other's. Yeah. I mean, I always think you can tell engagement, like, if those people get together, will they go out of their way to go say hi and check in? Or, you know, if they see that you've tweeted something meaningful or you really are trying to rally up your Patreon, will those people retweet or amplify you? So, in that sense, in this socially connected online world, I still think it feels like it's something to be part of, but also you and I know the energy that goes into creating your own channel, your own space, your own podcast. So of course, I think most of these podcasts, especially the ambitious ones, the dynamic is about the so their podcast and their baby. And that's cool. Like they can go out on stage as solo artists. And then after the gig, you know, if we're in a bar together, we'll mingle, right? That's kind of how I see it. Yeah, definitely. And, um, I also think, although we're not very, very tight knit as a community, the overwhelming feeling of it is creativity and support for each other. Because everyone has an understanding and we'll talk about what equipment to use or, you know, they know what's going on in each other's milieu. So I feel, yeah, disconnected but connected. Yeah. So uh, we've got two ice breaking questions. Uh, the first one, uh, what's your routine like at the moment? Are you still in lockdown? Were you in lockdown? What, what's, what are things like for you uh, on a day-to-day -day basis? I live by myself. Um, at the beginning of lockdown, I was very disciplined and every day I mapped out my hours from nine right to bedtime. So from nine o'clock to nine o'clock, um, I had my hours mapped out. Um, I went through a breakup in lockdown, so that was interesting. Um, uh luckily i don't mind my own company and it was the best kind of breakup where we're still friends um but i think as lockdown has progressed i have had way less of a schedule i used to read so much i could read like a book every one or two days and i'm reading a lot less i'm streaming on twitch a hell of a lot more because i need the company in my flat in the evening um and i used to always wake up at six every day and I've lost my early wake up. I'm now waking up at like seven, eight, which for me is really bad because I'm very productive in the morning. Um, but the good thing about lockdown in the last three or four weeks is as restrictions have been easing, I've been driving to 
forests and the countryside and being able to walk, which is my my favorite thing. I love being in nature. So that has been my lockdown so far. Great. I'm very, yeah, I see you. You keep rating, you keep rating books. There's a swimming pool passing by. Uh, sorry, you know, we live the life in London. We got a swimming pool with a view over the city from here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you you always post those reviews, those ratings of books, and you were going mm -hmm. so fast uh, reading those. I'm very jealous of that. I, I cannot even manage to read a single book, even if it's a role-playing book uh, lately. What's it's your secret? Um, <laughs> my secret is, when I was young, I had a very fraught childhood. I was very anxious, and I was a scared child. But if I could find somewhere to hide with a book, life was better. Also, here's a exclusive. When I was little, I used to stammer. So sometimes if I'm very tired, you'll hear me stammering, like it comes back. So when I was little, I was kind of taught, when you're reading, Mira, read ahead, and then the sentence will form in your head and you know what, it will help you form sentences when you're speaking. Wow. So, so I, I really, as I begot, became a better reader, I learned to communicate better. So now it's just my safety and my sanctuary, and I love reading. I can disappear into a book and be completely absorbed and just look up, and it's like an hour or two later. And I, I love it. It feeds my soul and it nourishes me. And the reason I keep putting it out there on, twi on Twitter every time I'm, this book got five stars, this book got two stars, is to make that connection because I love talking about books with people. So it's really nice when someone tweets back or even if they hated the book. I love that. It's so nice. So have you Twitch, is that, would you say is that that's the new hobby, skill or interest you developed uh, during the lockdown? It's really interesting. I went through my breakup and one of my friends was worried about me and suggested playing computer games and said, I think you'd really like Fallout 4. And I was like, no, I can't, I can't do shooting and I, I hate violent games. I like Life is Strange. I like Monkey Island and he bought it for me. He bought it in my, gave me PlayStation wallet money. And then I, I did Twitch a while ago and I became an affiliate and I made like, I don't know, $5 on there or something. Wow. I, I thought, I'm not making what? $5 today. <laughs> well, since I have been streaming, and it is a new skill because I could never ever do first person shooter before. With Fallout 4, it has a special system for slow people. So now I can, I can kill zombies. And I've made about $60, $70 on Twitch. I have 11 subscribers. So once I get $100, I can have that money. I can take it out of Twitch. Yay! So I'm gonna keep going to $100, but also in the evenings, you know, playing a computer game is distracting, but also having people kind of chat and comment on you, even if they're like, oh my God, this is a dumpster fire. You are horrible at this game. Or, you know, I have hashtags in there saying, backseat gaming, welcome, please help me, I'm a beginner. So then you just don't feel like you're alone in the evening. And um, I actually got a Discord and a tip jar because people were like, you should have a Discord, you should have a tip jar. So. I guess this is building a little community of friends to keep me company in lockdown. But I played last night and it was like 29 degrees in the apartment. And I was like, this is crazy. Why am I doing this? But we had fun, you know? So yeah, it's a new skill. But um, I don't know how to Twitch from my laptop, which would be way easier because I prefer like, you know, story-based games. So that will be my second thing that I do. And then my third thing is, do I buy a PC? Do I buy a proper gamer chair? And do I start like wearing like ears and being cute? And green Once screen. You need to invest in the green, green. screen. Yeah. But so first I you get the green screen and then you need to invest into uh, the lighting because then you find out that your green screen is not properly lit. So then you, you get some uh, lighting rig. Uh, I, it did, I tried a bit of that when I was playing with Encounter Roleplay and it's uh, it's kind of a spiral of investing stuff. Uh, yeah. I, I really wish I had a corner, I could just leave things on so I could just stream from there. But uh, yeah, with a small apartment and my son around, that just, that's just not possible. Yeah. Your own studio, right? And it's yeah. 
know. I have to say, I play on a PlayStation, which I feel is very looked down on and reviled across Twitch. If you play a PlayStation, you're not as good as a PC gamer. I definitely feel that. Um, <laughs> if I'll buy a PC because I think that could be the beginning of a very slippery slope a very dangerous thing to do PC are so frustrating I mean you you start investing in them and then and then there's a new thing and you need a, you need a new whatever more RAM or an, an SSD drive it's it just keeps going on and on it's just not true that you can update your computer because when you need a new processor you need a new motherboard and if you have a new motherboard you need a new this or that it's it's really annoying and it's it's annoying that apparently game console i don't have time to play anyway but game console are going this way now so you get different versions of the same oh, xbox yeah. and you're like oh come on i just want one thing i can play with like everybody else with my game as good looking as everybody right. else for five or six years that's all <laughs> come on i mean i feel you i i completely echo that um i have to say it's really funny i can see in the chat that someone my friend tom aka moomin d berry oh, we got two toms the then we got best cut tom from the rpg academy and got tom moomin the berry then so tom is one of my best friends and he has been phoning me over the 35 hours he's been playing The Last of Us. And I was gifted that game. I played a bit of it. I knew I was going to hate it. I read ahead. It's horrific. And he now has PTSD. Not joking. So it's a very hardcore game. And I said to him after 35 hours, hey, Crystal, I told you not to play that game. But he played it. So yeah, there you go. Well, no, he's, he's saying to you, if you should play The Last of Us 2. So are you gonna? No way! No, I, I was literally gifted that game and I played the first, I don't know, first hour or two? And it's, I, it's very, very, very dark. It's too dark for me. Yeah, my but brother I, told I, me a bit about it. My, my brother works in video games for people who, who don't know. And uh, I mean... It seems interesting, there's a lot of fans, so... It's just... It just when I was told, oh yeah, but it's it's so dark, it tells you it's bad to kill someone, but the game doesn't give you a choice. So it's like, okay, you kill that person, don't you feel guilty? It's like, N yeah, but no, because you didn't give me a choice. You, I was not hanging around like in Zelda, deciding whether or not I want to to kill that deer. You just put me in front of someone, like I think in GTA, Grand Theft Auto, there was something like that, like, Oh, do you want to kill that person? No, I don't want to. Well, the game is not continuing then. And you're like, that's not a choice. That's not a Gen C. So you cannot blame me for my moral choices. No, I agree. And from what Tom told me, that's not even the worst thing that the game makes you do. Yeah. And also, I, we can't say because spoilers, but it makes you do some pretty horrible shit. And the other thing is, I think because you and I, we love... RPG and games and choices and you know I love gaming where you can reflect a trait either you're like stealthy or you're charismatic so I really struggle where you just have these playable movies and you have no bearing on the outcome I think I've been exposed also to too much of the meta of the game uh, some uh, controversy some stuff related to Critical Role or uh, members of the cast of Critical Role and it was like oh that that feels that seems yucky so um, I don't know. It's um, what was what was the controversy? Did they treat the actors badly or something? Uh, I mean, I'm not sure if it's the the way the fans react, which is a bit yuck, or if it's people involved in the production. But uh, you know, with with game being more and more, I mean, there's motion capture and uh, a member of the cast motion capture a character and uh, the main producer of the game. Uh, motion capture another character and the two have a uh, physical moment oh. together and it's yeah it's I don't know if it's some people on Twitter who are uh, seeing too much meaning into something but it just yeah I don't know it, it doesn't sit very right to me it's a it's also the game, video game industry is, 
it's quite bad. Uh, the sort of feedback I have about working conditions and this sort of things, it's sort of it's a it's kind of a turn off at the moment. So if, if I was playing video game, I've been considering doing some Twitch. Sadly, my my internet connection is too slow, as people can tell, watching just us having a simple interview. But uh, I think if I did, I, I would rather play older games, which. I mean, I doubt their production condition were that much better, but I don't know, I guess they all... I'd like to play X-Wing Aliens, especially with X-Wing Squadron... Oh, no, what is it called? Star Wars Squadrons coming. It would be nice to play this whole uh, flight simulator set in the world of Star Wars with a story. Um, uh, it, it's, it's quite cool. I think... Uh I think people buy me games. So people have bought me Last of Us 2 and they bought me Far Cry 5 and I fucking hate them. But I play them because people buy them for me and then they have fun watching me really be bad and really hate them. Well, that my it sounds like it's becoming your uh what do you call that your your pitch, your USP, uh, that that uh, Mira that we force to play games she she hates so kind of, uh, a different uh, twist on the angry video game nerd. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the really distraught, upset. Um, the other thing I want to say, Callum, is uh, people were moaning at me because of my um, streaming quality and uh, the resolution. I always had to play very small resolution. And then I got an Ethernet cable and my life has changed. Uh, you mean you so were using the Wi-Fi before? Yeah. Oh no, I, so I'm Ethernet. I'm already I'm already with my Ethernet cable, so that's really my my bandwidth, which is too limited. Well, that is my uh, IT expertise run out. That's all I have. So. <laughs> yeah, on a regular on a regular basis, I go to a website and check. Oh, uh, did they install fiber in my street? And uh, no, they they haven't. I tried one week ago. They even called me back. And I was like, oh, so you, the, well, we check, you can leave Sky and so on, and uh, you can move us with us. Say, oh, you got fiber then. Oh, look, give me a second, I'm going to double check. Oh, sorry, we don't have fiber, so actually we, I called you for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, thanks, mate. <laughs> <laughs> you must have been so excited and then like, don't, I would never play Silent Hill. Never. Ah, it's no, no, no. that's proper good though. It's really, really good. I mean, it's, uh, in terms of storytelling and so, I don't know how it aged, uh, to be honest. But uh, yeah, back in the days, uh, that was something. I feel like I would play the games I love. I, it's really going to age me. Uh, anything written by Ron Gilbert, so Monkey Island, for example, and then he wrote Thimbleweed Park, which is a great game. Uh, all those old Sierras. Um, not Stranger Things. Life is Strange. I loved, loved, loved the first two. Um, Detroit, the robot one, being human. Like, so I, I really love those kind of games. But actually, Callum, this is another thing. I've started playing an online game. It's like interactive text adventure called Fall in London. And it's okay. by Failbet, who also do like Sunless Skies. And it's basically like text adventure where you are building up stats and stuff. And I was thinking maybe I could write a text adventure. Because when I grew up, my first gaming experience was The Hobbit on the ZX Spectrum. And you had mm. to type, open door, say hello to Gandalf, you know? So, who knows? Yeah. Maybe we'll just go retro. I'm not sure, but I think there are, you know, like software or system where you... you Quotation mark. You just fill them with your text and answers. I think that they're probably tools for you to create this sort of games yourself without uh, extensive uh, knowledge. Uh. Yeah, I would love to design a game. I want to be a game designer one day. Why are you working you on your own game? I am working, but not very quickly. But your, how is your game going? You should. Tell me about your playtests and what's going on with your game. Uh, quite well. Uh, actually, last weekend I ran four sessions of. Uh, so my game is Paris Gondo, the life-saving magic of inventoring, which you played, Mira. 
Uh, yes. It changed a bit since then, not much, but uh, little changes here and there following a playtest. And yeah, I ran four sessions last week. It was a little bit of fundraising for the uh, uh, NAACP, so it's a US organization uh, for the advancement of, um, of colored people. Um, and uh, no, yeah, it was quite cool because I, I had, as my players, had quite a few people I'd interviewed in the past and I knew from the industry. A few new people also, interesting people, it was cool. But uh, yeah, among my players, I had Chris Birch from Modifius. I never played with him. And it's, I mean, it's, it's quite an honor to play with Chris, who, who's the, the founder of such a big company as Modifius. I also had Linardi, who is the, the head of the Call of Cthulhu line at Chaosium, and she's She's a fantastic woman. I love interviewing her, and uh, she was great to to play with. And uh, I, I'm f I'm forgetting so many people, but yeah. I, I, long story short, f as a replacement for Origins Online, I I sort of opened my virtual uh, uh, you call that Rolodex, <laughs> and and sent a message to everyone uh, I remotely run into in, uh, in the past so so there are a few other people who might be interested who, who haven't played it yet but I, I really look forward to playing it and the feedback's been very encouraging uh, I'm I'm gonna run more sessions at the gauntlet for their community event uh, by the way I really recommend to check out the gauntlet for r r joining uh, online role-playing game sessions I had a blast playing two with them so far and now every Monday I'm gonna play Blades in the Dark and I didn't even know they're gonna put them they recorded them and they, they should be on YouTube uh, they're gonna have a big community event so people can go there and subscribe for games for uh, I think it runs from a Thursday the 19th of July till uh, Sunday the, the whatever and uh, yeah, no, it's it's encouraging. It's just I need to get back at writing, uh, finalizing the rules, uh, making a replay text based on a, a transcript of a game session. Uh, so that's the plan once my son uh, heads back to nursery next week uh, and then get back at more seriously applying for jobs now because there are jobs offer. But uh, yeah, I'm very proud of this game. It's, uh, it's a nice experience, it's very interesting. I'm engaging in a very different way with a big chunk of the role-playing community, which is designers. And when you engage with them while developing your own game, uh, yeah, the level of engagement, the type of exchanges you have is very different than when you are just there to interview them. So it, it's quite fascinating. Yeah. That sounds exciting. You should put the link up to Gauntlet. Yeah, I will. I didn't even know that existed. And I, so many of my friends are playing Blades in the Dark and they say it's amazing. Can you tell me a bit about that game? I want to try it. Yeah. I don't know anything about it. So Blades in the Dark, a bit like uh, Powered by the Apocalypse, you had uh, the, what was it called? Apocalypse game. And they made a, a line of other games. The, the the rules you can use them for the system. So Blades in the Dark is the first forged in the dark game, and since then th a number of other games came out with the same system. I'm saying that because I was listening to the Gauntlet podcast, and they were telling how it's interesting that PBTA and Forge in the Dark have that in common that the originals are good, but if you go to the six or seven new version made by somebody else actually it, it gets even me better because it's leaner but uh, with that in mind Blades in the Dark itself um, it solves something which I, I found very annoying which was so a heist you know having a heist in a game in a movie that's very exciting a heist and in a role playing game I thought it was the most cumbersome thing to do <laughs> because <laughs> I said that several times on the show, you and and Persephilia had the same se on several sessions also. You show up for a heist, you spend three hours arguing about a plan with the other players. Right. It's really annoying and because you are not in a position of trust with your game master, your kind of old style game mastering, you try to really anticipate whatever could happen with your plan. 
So what's happening is either the plan works and congratulations, you have cut off any thing from happening. <laughs> the heist is actually very boring. It just goes according to plan. So you follow a script, you create it uh, yourself. But most of the time, the script doesn't work. Uh, so you plan for three hours for nothing because <laughs> of goes the plan. So it's totally useless. Uh, Blades of the Dark is heist foc a heist focus game. You play a gang of criminals in a uh, medieval fantasy, a bit technological, not quite aberrant, but a bit like that. There's, there's a mono electric monorail and things like this. But you play criminals, and most of the game is doing heist and dealing with the time off between the heist. But you don't plan the heist. You do something before the heist, like you survey or you say, oh, I'm going to go interrogate people, or try to get some information, or try to get some equipment for the heist. But when you but you start the heist right away. You just tell the game master, okay, we're going to enter by pretending to be two uh, employees of a florist because there's a wedding reception and we're going to try to enter this way. And what happens then is, okay, you're in front of the uh, the person uh, who uh, who's taking the the names of people entering and leaving the building. Uh, w what do you do? And you do a flashback. So first of all, not even flashback. Your inventory. In your inventory, you don't decide what you have on you. So in the case of that scene we played, we decided to pass for two employees for a forest carrying a very large flower pot or a flower arrangement and that allowed the two of us so you decide I think it's whether you have three five or seven objects and if you have seven objects you really carrying a lot of stuff you really like Arnold Schwarzenegger once he fully equips with uh, his machine gun before the, the big action scene so you're not discreet at all but because we had a big flower pot we said well we put the equipment in the flower pot and that allows us to have five objects each. And the way it works is that your character sheet's got a long list, somewhat long list of objects. You don't decide which are the five objects. You tick them as you go. So when we arrive in front of the, the guy in my booklet, it's a bit like PBTA, you pick a booklet, so it's very easy to create a character. I said, Okay, uh, well, actually, I've got forged documents saying that we got a, we, I got a fake invite and it was in my list of things I could take. So I take a uh, strong, very robust fake identity from my booklet, The Spider. I ticked it and then we go forward, then we arrive, then the game master said, okay, what do you, um, where are you going? And the other player is like, well, I have a flashback. There's a flashback and it shows that ahead of the heist, I went and I had a drink with someone who knows the layout of the area and I had a lot of drinks with that person and managed to have that person tell me information about the layout of the place. So you decide that that happened on the spot and then you make your own role and you find out if the person lied to you, the person had a fuzzy memory or if the, the information was right. But you don't... You come up with what was the planning of the heist as you do the heist. Uh, like you run into a guard. Well, I corrupted this guard before the heist. Uh, I met him and gave him money. Or I black blackmailed that person. You come up with all of that. So at the end of the day, our heist went very well. But it was still very stressful and exciting because we discovered as we went everything we prepared ahead of the heist. Like you would watching Ocean's Eleven, you you don't see people planning and then it goes to plan. You see, oh yeah, but actually actually Sandra Bullock had already stolen the jewels a week before or something like that. I love that. I mean, um, I definitely want to try playing Blades in the Dark. Nidalena in the chat is my friend Ipek and she is the one every Saturday or every day she plays it, she puts a comment in her Facebook about what happened in the game and it sounds so fun. So every Saturday I've been playing Uncharted Worlds, which is powered by the apocalypse. And we had a raid, we had to do a heist and you were completely right. It was like hours and hours planning. My character is an ambassador with absolutely no heist skills because there were no people to charm. It was just robots. It was a very distressing 
it then you know it went horribly wrong and i lost my spleen so i think you probably had a better time with your massive flower pot yeah and if you check out the the gauntlet uh, not only it's blades in the dark i played but it's a it's a special play set someone is developing in which you you don't play criminals you play vigilantes so you're good guys instead of being kind of bad guys because in the original blades in the dark everybody is bad you're criminals everybody around you are yeah. criminals uh but uh i you know i like the idea so much that i think that even with all the systems that's how i'm likely to run heist even in star wars with because you could still do it with any other system it's just you accept that people can come back on what they said and have a flashback and have why being in the middle of the house alone trying to lockpick a, uh, a door rather than ask they g them for a lockpick lock pick uh, check you could tell you yeah. could let them have a flashback in which they seduced one of the guards using a seduction role to have the key in their hand and maybe yeah. they got a key in the end but they failed their seduction so the key is not working or is the, the key for the wrong door or something like that I and can you tell me and people watching what is the gauntlet because this is the first time i've heard of it outside the game with red wizard needs food badly well the the gauntlet i had heard of them quite a lot they were often mentioned on different podcasts about gaming theory uh because you no know, and then even a french podcast i listened to uh of which william who you know uh, is part of they would mention the gauntlet when having a discussion like they would parallel the discussion and gauntlet, gauntlet so it's a gaming community uh it's a forum which is very impressive and just the the infrastructure of the forum is impressive because you get a, a number of features which are built in and uh forums can be very dead and dreadful this one remains uh, uh, manages to be pretty active but so the gauntlet they got a podcast the gauntlet podcast they got plus one forward which is another podcast about strictly pbta as far as i know and in the gauntlet in the mm -hmm. forums the community there's a lot of game designers uh people like josh fox for instance uh, who i saw uh being around there and kat tobin uh they they're there and a lot of them are play testing their game and because the, the community itself has got a lot of game designers, it's a good place if you're designing a game to go and not only play test your game, but ask questions. Say, okay, I'm trying to do that, but it's not working quite as I wish. And you post a question and there's a very uh, uh, informed community and passionate community to answer your questions. So, so you got the podcast, you got the forums, and then you've got the Hangouts, which are weekly games which you can join uh any of them uh you if you support the patron you 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 can answer the rsvps a bit faster so you people might consider doing that and so the anger is all the time and there's going to be a every month or every two months uh it's going to be my first but they're having a community event which is uh several days of uh like a mini convention but online with a lot of games being run uh, but like designers, uh, as part of the gauntlet, you got um, I forget his name, but one of the dev developers of Hearts of Wulin, for instance, which I wanted to play for for a while, which is uh, Wuxia thinks uh, Hidden Dragon, Crouching di Tiger. So you got all these kung fu swords fighting, but at the same time a lot of romance and uh, the the things oh. inspired by uh, Jap Chinese TV shows and movies. Uh, like D Detective D also, uh, so that's a game which is developed by people from there. I think Passion de la Passione, Passion de la Passione, is also developed by someone from the Gauntlet, which is a telenovela role-playing game. So the, the, I'm I'm, lis I'm listing the game I I I found in uh, for the next community event uh, uh, which I want to play. Uh, this is gonna be. Telenovela game. That sounds amazing. Yeah, that, that I would love I doing that. So my f my first game with them was Remembrance. Um, it was run by Dono. Uh, I might have his family name wrong. Uh, McCarthy, I think. Apparently, it's co-designed with Cat Turbin from uh, Pelgrane Press. And Remembrance is about um, the history of Ireland. So you play characters through different major events of Ireland. 
the Easter Rebellion, the um, what is it called? The Independence uh, fight, uh, and then uh, the Civil War, which I had, I didn't even know that happened. The, the Civil War in Ireland, and then. Uh, sort of the 50s, 60s, you are at a, at a funeral of a character, might be an NPC of one of the players, but you, you go through different generations and the sort of struggle and uh, f uh, what, what, do call f what do you say fratricide in, in English? Uh, you know, sort of brothers and, bro and sisters against one another sort of situation you, you had in Ireland, so... But it was very early stages of the playtest, uh, and then you got stuff like the Spire, uh, Root, uh, yeah, many, many games there. Uh, pretty much everything you can think of. Uh, yeah. All of all of that sounds very indie, but yeah, the, there's there's things which are slightly more mainstream. Uh, Knights Black Agent, which I, I want to try. Uh, so yeah, a, a lot of good stuff. Uh what that one is that sounds interesting that's a great title which one Some, something knights of something uh, agent oh knights black agents so that's a gun shoe system it's by Pelgrin press uh, i believe was developed by kenneth Height and robin dilo and you play think jason bourne but in the oh, oh, amazing too yeah, jason bourne but with vampires so you work for the government oh. <laughs> yes, tell them, yes. Okay, you, well, you need to do a list of all the stuff you're telling me about, and then I need to go to Gauntlet and be like, I want to play with you guys. I mean, you just go... I'm going to put the link, but... Uh, I'm just if... so happy. I'm very, very oblivious, so I feel like when I get time to talk to you about new games, it basically can become very expensive very quickly, because I'm like, oh, these all sound really fun. But you know, I, I've adopted this view now. I want to. I'm trying to avoid purchase games which I have n I have not played, and I'm very happy to have found the gauntlet to to play games. And the, I don't know. It's it's just easier to to join games than uh, other communities. I'm I'm part of. I find. And uh, no, I just had a lot of fun playing with them so far. I mean, there's there's also a lot of stuff being run as part of si system check. At London RPG community and the roleplay event is online also at the moment, so there's really a lot of options for for joining um, uh, games. So yeah, I'm just so nice black agents, hearts of fooling. I'm checking the community uh, thing. Uh, microscope, have you heard of Microscope? Yeah. It's sort of a game in which you you develop universe. So that's an indie game, but you you come up with a a universe together with the player. So some some people they play microscope to have a world, and then they can play the world in whatever other system they wish. Like it could even be Dungeons and Dragons, for for instance. That makes. I've had some DMs and GMs who our session zero they call it a microscope session, and oh, they build the world. To I didn't realize it was an actual like game. It was an actual title of something. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, the, you know, it's funny, uh, today uh, uh, French Twitter was ablaze, it, no it was not, but uh, <laughs> there were people, there's uh, someone uh, somewhat influential in the uh, tabletop RPG scene in France who was saying, I'm concerned about tabletop role-playing games in France because a lot of people are playing online and that's a bad thing for role-playing games. That's rubbish. That's not true. <laughs> There's so many people I know and I see online. There, we never played as many different role-playing games with as many different people playing online. It's awesome. You know, I, I, I'm not sure when I will come back to playing in-person role-playing games. It's gonna be really for mm -hmm. special occasions because it's just such a hassle, uh, especially in pubs and so on trying to arrange four or five people in the same location which they may have to travel to and you know if people have kids or if people have jobs it's so hard and I think thank god for I have to say when I first went through like having a breakup knowing that I had games scheduled were like highlights because you could just be in those moments and it was like it was so so important 
But, you know, don't get me wrong, I do miss seeing people and hugging them. I miss the sound of D20s rolling. I really miss the sound of dice and feeling them. Um, my whole life has shifted towards D6s, which I'm not happy about, but thank God for online gaming. And I think you're right. Like, I've tried a few more systems and I've been able to play test. So, but what was this French person's main worry? Was it like the death of social graces or? I don't know. I didn't or consult the, the original source. I guess he made it as part of his podcast. Or, although I think his podcast is on a break, so maybe it was a blog post. But yeah, just I don't know. He, I guess he, he just wasn't interested, curious, or it's not his thing to uh, to play online. So he, he didn't try, and you know, even if he tried, maybe he didn't like it. But it's just you know this blanket statement sometimes, uh, which get people mad, and I, I get it because you know that's that's his thing and it's fine it doesn't have to be everybody's thing to play online but just coming and saying oh this is a threat to uh, to the hobby like i mean come on uh, really there's a lot of stuff very exciting stuff happening at the moment it's just this this i think it's moving forward i think it can influence also playing in person in the sense that there's this feeling i find that you know, I understand people who are in smaller places, they don't have the luxury of having uh, a great number of players around them, so they don't have a lot of options. But I think even when you have the options, we're still in a culture which finds it a bit taboo to to swap around, you know, to shop around for players and game masters. It's It's a bit felt like, I bought this game, I want to run this game. And you sort of have to run it with yeah. your usual players or if you're one of the players and the game master got the book you sort of have to play that game with the game master even though there's so many games there's so many different tastes that maybe you know that one game it's not it's not the thing for the two of you you know you're not matching on that or maybe uh maybe you just want to to play it so it's not it's not even people are more or less interested in things just it's just fresh to to have turns playing at uh, uh, different things and i think it's something even if you play for real it's much nicer to start to be open minded about playing different games with different people and not being uh yeah frustrated by having to play di you know not force your taste on a game master or on a player because you want to try something or not being in that situation of oh, I bought this game, I'm very excited and then I don't have anyone to play it with. I mean I got here, I got Damn the Man Save the Music in which you play you play uh, a group of people working in a music shop in the 90s. It's the last day of the music shop, it's gonna close, it's inspired by Empire Records and I got no one to play it with really because the, the people I used to play with are just not interested by that and it's I mean, it's fine. It's normal. Uh, yeah. But, pff, yeah. You know, one of my first jobs was in a record shop in the 90s, so I'm down. <laughs> I'll come play with you. But um, I, I agree. I mean, actually, I started playing D&D &D at the Saturday meetup groups, which is run by Xander, which is obviously on a halt at the moment. But I remember being so terrified because every week you would go and potentially have to make friends with another group of strangers if you wanted to play a different game. That I was really happy to just find a group, build the friendships and stay with that group forever. And maybe on, and I, you know, that was for the me, that was the right decision because I made some really great friends and then I stuck with the hobby and they're still my friends. Now. But I think online, it's less scary to kind of play with strangers maybe. It's less of a risk socially if anything really horrible happens, you can pretend your connection's gone and just like blink out of existence. And, but that, yeah, I never really thought of it like that. I'm sure, for example, I've played in groups where I know the people that I'm playing with really hate fifth edition D&D. They're really done with it. So then when you play a game that's fifth edition and it's not so fun, then people are like, well, it's the system. And then other people want to play fourth edition. And I find fourth edition like, so I hate it so much. So that's quite an interesting point that you raise. You know, people were less nervous and they could just 
choose a game that suited them. So yeah, that's what we get with online. A little bit more choice, I guess. Yeah, uh, I mean, that, that doesn't mean people should not, you know, try to get out of their comfort zone a bit and and just stick to, to a, s a certain time, but yeah, it's curiosity and yeah, and flexibility. I mean, it's not, so sometimes it, it feels like retreating role-playing games like a, uh, a sort of a romantic relationship, not, not to go into more physical terms, and, and it's uh, people have to be faithful to one another rather than find what works for them. Oh, oh. yeah. Well, he threw up my son, threw something away from the balcony, so his mother had to go downstairs to pick it up. So he's learning to live with the consequences of his actions. It's attachment, right? He's very attached to objects now. Is it the object stage? I don't know. I did child psychology for a very short time. I think I have a book up there somewhere still. I don't know. Awesome. He's just throwing a lot of things away, and uh, it's uh, it's frustrating uh, to find how to to teach him. Uh, I mean, we, we read a lot of books about how to teach children and uh, not not to punish them, but uh, it's it's difficult to f to send a message across and uh, find the the right balance. You want to post it? He's got post. I mean. I'm working with adults. I have friends who are losing, you know, who are being way more stand from me than maybe right now because it's just a hot and the situation's too much and we've been cooped up forever. So everything is like way more tense. Like tiny little things that happen are now like, oh my God, this has happened? Lockdown yeah. living. Yeah, I remember hearing someone sing on, a, on another podcast on Misdirected Mark podcast that. They were not exactly depressed or in a bad mood, but the the membrane between being into a somewhat regular, stable state of mind to to being very sad or enraged was very thin. So, and I, I totally have that. I, uh, recently, I went um, I went shopping and. Uh, just a, a, a van honked at me and said a, a few things for me and, and I lost it completely. Like I went for the, the F word, told the guy that <laughs> none of his BS and I, I didn't want to engage whatsoever with it. I mean, even today, someone, she was not uh, being a, an awful bad person, but I didn't flip that time, but I just had no time for uh, this lady. Uh, my son was trying to get into the bushes of a park and I was struggling keeping him out. He would yell when I was g getting him out of uh, trying to play with the dirt and the bushes there because those bushes are in a park in an area next to a number of restaurants and, and, and pubs. So they're definitely, these are dirty areas. <laughs> Best, you know, the, the, there's enough bushes for people to do more than pee there, and pee would be uh, already quite annoying. So I'm doing that when my son pulling him away from that, and I turn and I got this uh, elderly lady with a dog who tell me, yeah, about the bushes, and I'm like, what? Like, what revelation do you have for me? Yeah, your son shouldn't go in there because we are close to pubs and uh, a lot of people, and I was so close to tell her, to get the F away because like yeah guess what you, you've seen me half a meter away from you trying to keep my son away from those bushes I don't want you to to, to give me intelligence about that I really really don't care stay in your zone at the moment it's really like that where I go out just people stay away I don't want to engage whatsoever and a smile and a nice nod this is all I can take and give it's it's like everyone's been kept apart from each other for so long so now social interactions are really heated like oh my god I can't I think when the storm breaks and the heat goes down hopefully everyone will just chill out a bit I mean yeah but it's yeah, it's, it's delicate and uh, yeah be between the people who really don't don't understand what's going on and they are careless and the people who are, who are a bit more careful not only about COVID-19 and the weather, uh, but uh, with the 
the situation regarding racism uh it's it's stressful it's just yeah um yeah that's <laughs> there's a lot of stuff to deal with and um but we cannot exactly say that uh our representative at government and we sort of deserve what we have uh are very good with things uh yeah yesterday and today i was very mad at something also which happened politically which is not a huge deal for the wider co population but i was like really now seriously this is happening now uh i thought we were done for a while with that it's yeah it's on a short fuse everybody is on a short fuse and uh, i i look forward to my son being back uh, at the nursery and hopefully uh resent uh, myself yeah you have like someone on the chat going as a parent i relate 100 percent to that story yeah, Tom. Uh, Tom from the RPG Academy had a. There's a lot of people relating <laughs> in the chat right. room. It's uh, yeah, Tom. Yeah. Tom is having. A, I won't go into detail because it's not uh, the people's business. But uh, yeah, no, I know Tom. You, you had your own. Uh, I mean, I'm unemployed, which is something to deal with. Uh, and Tom has got a job which is highly demanding, uh, despite uh, COVID-19. So we we all have a sort of our own situations yeah. which are very stressful it's, it's really strange like also i think that might be chris d20 future show to yeah be with you my to richard my tolerance oh richard um so i live by myself which is like almost kind of a blessing like yeah it gets lonely sometimes but at least if I'm losing my shit, I'm just yelling at myself. Like, why did you do that? Why did you burn that? Why didn't you turn the iron off, Mira? You know? Um, but I feel like what we're experiencing is like, it's a clash of the cultures um, in everything from people who don't understand why Black Lives Matters to people who don't understand, stay off the fucking beach and two meters apart, you idiots. And it's like clash of the culture and clash of like clash of the titans epic scale right it's everything is so polarized it's like brexit remain you know and all i can really hope is that i feel like we've gone too far for either side to kind of sit down and be like i understand where you're coming from it's definitely it's like a war of like this viewpoint you know and and i i relate very much to the struggle where i'm what people might call white passing. My mum is Indian and my dad was Scottish. So during uh, Black Lives Matter, like people who didn't realize I, I don't class myself as white were saying things to me that just really, I was like, we, I would try and explain or offer a viewpoint. And then where it was rejected, I was able to walk away from those people and it just, I think, you know, the situation has really, I mean, one of my friends said it really well. So I belong to a club that I'm very proud of. So I, I've tipped this down a bit. So I belong to Hate, which is a gaming club. And as soon as everything happened in America, we changed our banner. We changed everything to reflect Black Lives Matters and trans rights are really important to us. So over this, these past few weeks, what it has done, it's shown how polarized, pe polarized people are and where there were racists or people who just don't care about Black Lives Matter, they emerged, they kind of came to the fore, which was just really interesting and enabled us as a club to kind of say, we don't want this kind of behavior. We're really tolerant and loving and accepting. And, um, I guess that's a good thing, right? You then can try and educate people. Once you know what their issues are, you can try and talk to them or, or try and have them empathize. But at the same time, it's really crushingly sad because some people just have really fucked up views and don't care about other humans. So yeah, and I, it's yeah, it's it's tough, and it's I mean, I mean, there's fundamental differences also be between. Uh, we we've been through crisis after another crisis, and COVID nineteen it's a crisis, and that's a crisis we all wish to end. A uh, Black Lives Matters, I don't want it to end. I mean, not the movement, I, I, and it's not it's not a crisis of 
oh, this thing is happening now, so we wish w that it's over. No, it, it's something which has been ongoing, and even uh, people, I don't know what you call them, uh, well, ally or ally-minded people uh, realize, I hope, uh, that things are way worse for black people than than we realized. Yeah. So I don't want Black Lives Matter to end. I want it to be answered uh, and things to happen in relation to that. But I don't, I mean, yeah, I don't want people to be hurt and or in danger, but I know that it's not, it's not, oh, I want, I want those riots. Uh, and, uh, I, I want police violence to end. I, I don't want, I don't want the rightful protest of people and the struggle of people to, to end until it achieves what it's supposed to achieve, uh, which is a, a a more balanced thing. And uh, yeah, and I mean, there's so much. Right? Like, wh when was it? When I mean, it did not start, but in the same fashion, everything which came out again regarding uh, everywhere, really, uh, the treatment of women on Twitch, in the Hollywood, uh, the video oh game industry. We, we, it's all of that coming. And again, it's not about Oh, this is happening. No, no, this has been happening for a very long time. It's just now people have enough of that and are trying to, to deal with it or at least raise flags about that. So, yeah, and yeah. it's... I mean, I, yeah, I, I do feel in my heart I'm hopeful because I see a lot of intention to change. Oh, Richard had to go. Bye, Richard. Um... Yeah, I, I do feel really hopeful. I am just hopeful that we will, are creating a new world order where, where you know, it's more equal whether you're a trans person or whether you're black, you know, that you feel heard. And wouldn't it be great if being tolerant and loving could be what we leave for our new generations? Because, yeah, that's just my dream and my hope. I guess. And through this, through the awful stuff that's happening, you know, I am really pleased that corporations or, you know, humans are, I mean, it's kind of scary, right? People, everyone's being held to account, but a lot of people are kind of taking on the criticism and trying to change and move forward and become educated, which I think feels really new, right? Because like you're saying, most things are a crisis and it's over, but this kind of continues to roll. So let's hope that, you know. Yeah, let's, yeah. Ho let's hope. Uh, yeah, it's just, again, uh, I mean, uh, I tend to be optimistic, but uh, I I too we had made more progress than actually we, we have. Uh, th there's a lot of stuff going on, which I thought were things uh, of the, the past, uh, uh, maybe at least in, in proportion of things. So, so I still think things are better than they were 30 years ago, but uh, there's there's still a long long way to to do for for everyone on a very large number of subjects so uh, so we'll see uh, we'll yeah. see <laughs> wow we got really impassioned about very heavy topics yeah going back to something light uh, i'm putting you on the spot so are you willing to tell us more about your game design project now because you, you joined uh, one of the Jason Peter game launch, which are excellent if anyone out there wants to uh, to game design something. So have you joined a, one since, uh, because I missed a couple since last time and uh, have you revealed what you're working on so can people can help you more? I, I, the next time I come back, I want to have something written down that makes my ambition real. So whether that's a synopsis, or, you know, an encounter or some kind of like demonstration of how it's going to work. When I think when I go back, I will have something that I can talk through or even like a five minute session I can play with people in the chat. How fun would that be? So I haven't kind of got my shit together. So basically I have a, I listen a lot to the Magic Tavern podcast and they play they are in a fantasy land and their D and D equivalent is offices and bosses where they get to go and pretend to be like in procurement with their own hot desk. You know, whereas we get to be like a wizard with a staff, they get to have like a laptop and 
a suit. So I was just thinking of the idea of how you could run uh, an office week where the political choices and actions that you took in that office would reflect in your nighttime adventures in a fantasy kingdom. So it would be like a little bit Alice in Wonderland and whatever you did in the day in the normal office environment would then be translated. So Beryl, the receptionist, might become a fierce two-headed dog that's a gatekeeper to the dungeon that you need to get in. I like um, that. It's a bit like... It's, a, it's somewhat... Uh, sort of a Jason Pilgrim sort of thing. Except Jason Pilgrim was more about romance of... Romance of uh, teenagers with one another and rela the relationship take uh, epic proportion and big fights but here would be a uh, sort of yeah sort of Jason uh, Scott Pilgrim sorry yeah. Scott Pilgrim meets uh, uh, Agretsuko in a way have you watched yeah so I, I know Scott Pilgrim because uh, I love Edgar Wright that was an Edgar Wright movie but I never read the, the comics but um, I think it's I think the, to make the gameplay in the office funny, because I think it should be a, like a humorous, fun game. I was asking like loads of my friends, please, can you tell me about really crazy shit that's happened in your offices? And, you know, there have been examples of, you know, the mistress coming in and demanding to see the husband and then the wife turning up in reception, da 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 and you know the time that someone accidentally set fire to the microwave in the kitchen but no one was informed and did it you know so i think there needs to be lots of like i need to gather lots of stories to make the office element feel realistic so you have tasks to carry out like oh you need to you need to figure out like a budget and you need to talk to these people in order to get it and make that entertaining yeah and yeah so. I know you have the two an answer one another, but have you watched Agretsuko? Uh -uh. It's a uh, it's a Japanese anime. It's on Netflix, and it's uh, it's anthropomorphic animals, uh, but it, it, it's set in Japan or a version of Japan. And you follow, I believe she's a tanuki. She might not be, but yeah, it's uh, office life uh, with those animals. But the, the main character, she's a very uh, shy and reserved uh, office worker and she's being bullied uh, like a lot of employees are in Japanese uh, companies, uh, apparently. But uh, in the evening, she, she doesn't have fantastical adventures, but she's a, a fan of karaoke. So she goes to karaoke parlors, uh, often on her own, to, to sing uh, very heavy metal. I don't know what it's called, but like this type of metal in which you you scream your lungs out, and uh, that's the contrast of her being very cute, and at the same time, in the evening she goes there and she starts yelling about all the the problems she had uh, at work. I think you will have a lot of uh, office stories, inspiration. A, a good one. It's set a ja in Japan also. Oh, what is it called in English? I'm gonna Google it. It's stupeur et tremblement in French. Fear and Trembling by uh, Amélie Nothomb. Well, if you, if you, since you like reading, you should check out uh, some Amélie Nothomb. She's a, a Belgian writer, and uh, like anything uh, Belgian which is uh, remotely successful, uh, I've been fed to death uh, her name because as soon as someone is popular, successful in one field in Belgium, that's it. Belgium make them the only voice of this entire field, and you are you're sick to death of that single person. It's not that yeah. person's fault, but you got one person for comics, humoristic comics, you got one person for, for novels, you got one person for comedy or God knows what, and you're gonna, they're gonna be fed in your face yeah. through TV and advertisement all the time. But uh, Fear and Trembling, there's a very good movie with, uh, who's the actress? Uh, pom -pom -pom. Julie Delpy? Is that Julie? Sylvie oh, Testu. Really? Sylvie Testu. Sylvie Testu. Uh, I really recommend Super. Actually, that would be a nice uh, film studies. I should uh, I should record a film studies about it. That would be cool. Maybe I should have you for a film studies about Super and Tremblement. Maybe you can... R I, could, yeah. I could give you homework. You read the book, the novel, and then we watch the movie. We can compare and we can also discuss about your, your game design effort. And uh, I should get a third person That's who knows Fiasco very well. Let's do it. 
I'm up for it. That sounds really good. Great. Uh, well, I think on that, uh, is there anything else you wish to talk about? Um, no, I'm just, I know you have an uh, anniversary coming up. Bon anniversaire for, you're going to be older soon, my friend. Uh, yeah, so I've heard. <laughs> I mean, I'm, uh, it's going to be, uh, I'm hitting, uh, yeah. no, uh, what is it called in English? Um, um, what is it called? No. The the lamest oh, uh, cancer. Uh, c cancer is it called cancer in in English? In French, it's cancer. So yeah, cancer, uh, uh, which made me very disappointed in uh, Sensei when I found out the the cancer night. Uh, I thought it was a bit lame. Uh, but yeah, I'm oh. gonna I'm gonna hit. Uh, quarantaine in quarantine. So uh, forty in quarantine. <laughs> Woo! There's your theme. So this is my weekend, uh, birthday weekend. So I know Persephilia planned some secret stuff for me. We had planned a, a weekend of gaming extravaganza at first. With uh, we were supposed to play uh, poker tonight, uh, have a board game day, a video game day, have a tabletop role playing game day. That went uh, out of the window. But I still got a great uh, birthday gift today. We went to Borough Market and we got. Something I was, uh, what's the word, drooling over in uh, the the window of Borough Market, which is a, a, a very large motto and pestle. So I can pretend to be a, an alchemist. Oh, wow. So I can do proper curries now by uh, really properly mashing uh, spices together. Uh, yeah, but Monday, Monday is my birthday. I'm going to play Blades, Blades in the Dark again. And I'm very excited <laughs> because I love my character. <laughs> Well, have a wonderful, wonderful birthday, and thank you for inviting me to chat with you. It's so good to see your face. Yeah, well, likewise, and uh, I'll be calling you about, uh, uh, oh, again, what's it? Fear and Trembling by yeah. Amélie Nothomb. So now you, you, you've got homework, and uh, I'll let you know when we can uh, record the film studies about it. Fantastic. Okay. <laughs> Cheers, Au bye, revoir. thanks everyone. We got so many people in the chat room. Uh, if you haven't yet, please uh, subscribe because I'm not affiliate. I didn't, I'm not making money yet with that. I, I could with the help of everyone in the, the chat room. Uh, please subscribe and, uh, and so on. Uh, thanks, Mira, and uh, see you around. I'm going to help Persephilia with my son who is being uh, kind of hellish at the moment. Cheers, bye.